though, overnight, the Healy 100 became the Austin Healy 100. Like most young men, I was interested in cars. We'd got an MGTC at the time, uh, when the Healy was launched, at the 1952 Motor Show. And uh, it, it seemed to embody all the latest and best thinking in sports car design. Uh, the styling was very much up to date, and it was clearly uh, influenced by what was coming out of the Italian styling houses at the time. 25-year-old John fell in love with the car. He was an apprentice at the Austin Motor Company at the time and could not have afforded it if it wasn't for a generous inheritance. The list price was £1,063 and I got it for £925. But the blue car was the car that I wanted because it was the Healy colour. It was the colour that the car was launched in and the first 350 so cars were done in that colour. And it's a colour that Donald Healy introduced. I thought, good heavens, am I going to s sit in this beautiful car? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, John and I had just recently yeah. got engaged and everything seemed so perfect, mm. didn't it? That yeah. We'd got each other in this lovely car as well. I can tell you that um, when I drove the car home from the dealer, I was uh, struck by the, um, the responsibility of driving such an expensive car. I, in fact, my hands possibly perspired at times on the steering wheel <laughs> because it was such an expensive thing. You could buy a house, a small house for the price of a Healy, you know, and um, really it was quite unusual for someone in, of my lowly stages at the time to have such an expensive car. It, uh, it quite marked me out in many ways. Uh, not only did it look good, but it went good and sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> and it always smelt nice, didn't oh, it? Oh yes, it gives off a very evocative smell of warm leather. Yeah. The car's a very muscular car. It's not like modern cars with short stroke, high revving engines. It's a long stroke, slow running engine, but it's got a lot of torque and it surges under the yes. throttle. It doesn't accelerate like modern cars. It's quite a smooth acceleration, but it seems very powerful and it sweeps through curves very nicely. The Healy does require careful driving, particularly on wet or greasy roads. And I suppose really we're very lucky to be sitting here now, all the close shaves we've had in oh, it, aren't we? We've had a, we've had a few moments <laughs> of all kinds. Yes. <laughs> we were on holiday in Switzerland, I think it was 1962 or 63, and um, there was a straight road at the top of the Gotthard Pass and um, I thought, oh my goodness, we're going too fast. And uh, we put some left-hand turn on to go into the tunnel and, and it started to slide. And uh, I corrected it and it, it simply lashed round very, very quickly. And uh, there was the screeching tyres making this noise echoing off the tunnel walls. I remember John saying to me afterwards, I didn't hear you make a sound and I said, you couldn't hear me screaming because of the screaming of the tyres. <laughs> to this day, John doesn't know how he missed the tunnel wall or the truck coming the other way. And I thought, the, the thought that came to my mind was, how am I going to get the car back to England? <laughs> because I Not I hope is Heather going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, you see, Heather would recover from the bruises, but the car wouldn't. <laughs> I was 20 and John was 25 when we had the car mm. <laughs> and we've had photographs taken with it when we were married 25 years, when we were married 40 years, when the children were born and when they grew up and mm. now we're grey and wearing glasses and the car still as glamorous as ever. <laughs> we dearly love it, we really do, don't we? Yes. By the mid-1950s, companies like Triumph realised racing and rally success could sell even more sports cars on both sides of the Atlantic. This is my Triumph TR2 OVC276. Uh, it, the car is set up as it ran in the Alpine Rally in July 1954. The number on the side is the actual number it carried at that time. It was fitted with a complete set of wire wheels for ease of changing in case of punctures or anything of that sort on the front wheels. Alfin brake drums, which are aluminium, for heat dissipation when you're using a lot of brakes in competition. 
in the Alpine roads in those days were not tarmac, they were rough, so a strap across the bonnet to make sure that the bonnet doesn't jump open. Guards over the headlamps to stop stones breaking the glass. Fog and spot lamps for driving in the dark over the Alpine roads. And the horns fitted to the outside so that you've got plenty of loud noise if you want to get somebody out of the way. OVC 276 made history for triumph at rallies. But before the successes came years of trial and error development of prototype cars under the watchful eye of Sir John Black, managing director of the Standard Triumph Motor Company. Test driver Ken Richardson's first job was to assess Triumph's new TS20 sports car. My father took it out for probably a quarter of an hour on the local Coventry roads and uh, came back in very dissatisfied with it and went to Sir John Black's office and uh, Sir John asked the question, what do you think of it? And uh, my father said he thought it was the most bloody awful car he'd ever driven and it ought to be scrapped before it killed someone. Well, my father thought at the time he'd probably done himself out of a job, but um, based on my father's reports, the design engineers at Standard Triumph built a new chassis and the car was developed into quite a pretty little car, I would think. But before they could produce the car, Sir John Black heard that racing driver Sheila Van Dam had achieved 120 miles an hour in a modified Sunbeam Alpine on the Jebeka Superhighway in Belgium. Sir John Black called my father to his office one morning and he said, well, can a TR beat this record? And uh, my father apparently said, well, certainly not with the hood up but with a bit of a few aerodynamic modifications and a bit of development, I think I'm sure we could do it. Sir John gave the go-ahead to make the minor adjustments which would make the car competitive, and MVC 575, the second TR2 prototype, was shipped to Belgium. You can see here, they're actually converting it on the side of the road. You can see all the mechanics here, and indeed about six policemen busying themselves trying to help, I think. And <clears throat> for the speed runs, my father decided to take the driver's seat out and he actually sat on the floor on a cushion to keep his head as low as possible for air resistance. That's a close-up of father in the car. Obviously, I would think just before the run, he looks a bit pensive on that photograph. On the 20th of May, 1953, Ken Richardson took the TR2 to 124.095 miles an hour it became the fastest two-litre production sports car. I was only, I think, 10 or 11 years old when that car was built, but I still have fond memories of my brothers and myself sitting in one of Father's work's TRs. We pestered him to death, I think, for a trip to see the racing cars. So I actually grew up with the smell of racing fuel in my nostrils. The TR2, in its perfected form, was finally introduced in July 1953, a rugged, bluff-fronted car with more power than poise. The car drives very nicely. You can pick up round a corner. You can also throw it about quite a fair bit on corners. You can go through corners quite fast, providing you can see round it. You know there's nothing coming the other way. You can use the racing line. You can cut across a corner, use the apex. I like it because it's, it's nice. You can go up and down the gearbox. That's the most enjoyable. When you're actually handling the car, not just sitting in it, just driving along, holding the steering wheel in front of you. When you're actually manoeuvring the car around corners, along straights, around bends, that's the, the enjoyment of driving it. Together with two other TR2s, OVC 276 entered the Alpine Rally in 1954. It was to be one of the most challenging events of the year. The weather in the Alps was atrocious. Quite a number of years since they'd had snow and ice in the Alps at that time of the year. So it was a bad race from that point of view. The roads in the Alps in those days, of course, were not tarmac, they were all loose stones. So that meant that the cars took a hell of a battering, particularly from the stones underneath. Well before the halfway mark, a TR2 was the lead car in the rally, which took them through France, Switzerland, Italy and Austria. The three TR2s collected three prizes. They won the team prize, best cumulative time on selected hill climbs, and perhaps rather condescendingly, best performance of a non-French team. 
The 54 Alpine Rally was the first of many successes for the TR2.